Good morning. What an amazing space. Isn't this just beautiful? Um, so tomorrow belongs to those who prepare for it as an interesting challenge. You know, when I did my first event for Fundacion Telefonica in uh, Medellin, one of the challenges I made then, because there was a whole group of people missing from the event, and they were the people for whom tomorrow means the most, our children. And it amazes me, wherever I go in the world, that we don't include young people themselves more actively in really visioning what the future of education should be. Let me give you an example, because they are the experts. How many of you have got children of your own? Can you raise your hand if you have children? Yeah, I can tell, because you're all sat there like this. <laughs> I have two children. I have a daughter who is 17. It's why I travel. Now, I need to start by telling you a story about my daughter. Because, for me, it sums up the challenges we face and where the expertise really lies in terms of understanding the future. So, this year is my daughter's last year in school. Next year, she leaves home to go to university. <laughs> Maybe she won't come back until she's in her 20s. Maybe she won't come back at all. But we went recently, my wife and I, we went to her final parent consultation evening. You know where the teachers talk to us about your child's progress. And we went and we sat listening to her history teacher. She loves history. It's her favorite subject. And my wife and I sat down, and we listened to her history teacher tell us how wonderful our daughter is. He hasn't seen her bedroom. But he was telling us how wonderful our daughter was. He was telling us that her assignments, her essays, were amazing. He was telling us that she has the ability to write from so many different perspectives, understanding so many different points of view. He was telling us about how mature my daughter was. At this point, I started to laugh. And my wife did something that she's not done in the 23 years we've been married. She held my hand under the table. Now, because I'm a man, I misread the situation. I thought this was my lucky night. I couldn't have been more wrong. <laughs> because my wife knew why I was laughing. You see, I know how my daughter writes her essays. So what she does, she gets a title. She comes home in the evening. She has thousands of friends on her social networks thousands on Facebook, on Twitter. She tells her friends what her essay title is. And within minutes, she has people all over the world giving her the answers. <laughs> now, the interesting thing is this. A traditional teacher 
in a traditional classroom, in a traditional school, would tell you that my daughter is cheating. I disagree. I think my daughter is demonstrating 21st century skills. You see, as was said already this morning, the 21st century relies on collaboration. Collaboration is everything. Networking is everything. The truth is, in the world today, it's not what you know that defines you. It's how you collaborate. I would also argue that my daughter is demonstrating amazing skills because she has to take all of that information that her friends send her and she has to work out which bits are relevant. She has to edit. She has to question what she's being sent. She has to put it together to respond correctly to the challenge she's been given. And fundamentally, she demonstrates for me the biggest shift in what education needs to be in the future. And this is what I want to explore with you a little bit this morning. It is no longer about what you can remember and what you know. Because what you can remember and what you know matters not at all. Because with Google, we can find out what we need to know in hundredths of a second. What we need to be able to do is question and challenge and edit and frame. And the really interesting thing is, we sit here around the world talking and talking and talking about the future of education when actually there's a generation outside of rooms like this already living it. So the first thing I urge all of us to do is to spend more time learning from our children. Because in so many ways, they already have the answers. You see, the problem is this. We live in this world where we have an education system that is based on the education system that is nearly 200 years old. We live in a world where when we talk about the future of education, we don't actually look to transform the system. What we do is we come up endlessly with new ideas to put on top of what we already do. When you think about the last 20 or 30 years of education, we have talked and talked and talked about what education should be in the future. And we keep coming up with new ideas, and we write new papers, and new theories, and new things to do. And we've had technology. And we seem to think that technology by itself will transform education. Technology is a tool. It is not the answer to the future of education. None of the ideas are the answer, but we keep looking for the answer, the silver bullet. And as a result, I believe education has become far more complicated than it needs to be. I was saying this yesterday, and I want to repeat it again today, because this is really important to me. Education is not about systems and structures. Education is about people. Education will always be about people. I had an incredible opportunity a few months ago to have lunch with Eric Schmidt, who is the executive chairman of Google, one of the world's 
most successful organizations in the 21st century. And the first question I asked him was, will technology ever replace teachers? You know, he didn't even need to think about his answer. His answer was immediate. No, never. And he said something that really pleased me. He said, because education has always been and will always be about human development. And for human development to work at its best, it will always require human interaction. It is a human process. And it is more now than it ever has been. And so we need to revision what education means. We need to stop looking at things like the PISA International League tables and beating ourselves up because we're not top or we're bottom or we're in the middle. They are the most ridiculous things I've ever seen, those league tables. They mean nothing. The country at the top in 2012, well, it's not a country, is it? It's a city, Shanghai, a province of China. Do you know the only country in the world not celebrating that China is top of the International Academic League tables? China. They're now going through a radical reform program in their education system to stop being so academically focused. Because what they've realized is that whilst academic performance is really important in the industrial age, it hampers progress in the age of innovation, which is what we face in the second half of the 21st and the 22nd century. Let's not forget that, by the way. We keep talking about the 21st century as though it's in the future. There are children being born today who, because of strides in medical science, will be living well into the 22nd century. So we shouldn't be talking about how we prepare children to live in the 21st century. We now need to be talking about the 22nd century. And as we know, the 22nd century, more than this century, will be about entrepreneurship, innovation, and creativity. It will not be about factories making things over and over and over again. Even in China, they know this. In August, the Chinese government produced a new report into the future of Chinese education that when I first read it, I was amazed by. Because it talks about turning into law the idea that we must stop seeing education as an academic process. So, for example, in elementary schools in China now, it is illegal to set homework. Homework is now banned in Chinese elementary schools. Also banned in Chinese elementary schools is streaming by ability. The idea you separate out the clever from the rest. That's now banned in Chinese education. They are also at the moment going through the world's most radical program of getting rid of testing. Because what the Chinese government realizes that the system is so intense, there is not enough room for young people develop, to develop their own passions, their own interests, their own unique abilities. Meanwhile, the rest of us are trying to copy what China are now about to change. No wonder the Chinese are smiling. They're preparing their children for the future. We insist on preparing our children for the past. The Chinese are sat there saying, yes, please, have our system. Enjoy. Let me demonstrate what I mean. 
One of the other research documents that I find far more interesting than PISA is Gedi. I wonder how many of you have come across Gedi, the Global Entrepreneurship and Development Index. It's published every year, and currently there are 121 participating countries. And what Gedi does is it researches what percentage of a country's income comes from new business, entrepreneurship, and innovation. And then it ranks those countries in order, from the most entrepreneurial to the least. I've picked some of the countries that participated in the 2014 report. For fun, as a game. What I'd like you to do, while I have a sip of water, is to look at that list, because I've mixed them up, I'd like you to look at that list and work out which countries you think are the highest, most entrepreneurial, and which countries you think are the lowest, the least entrepreneurial, according to the 2014 report. Collaborate with the person next to you. I'll only give you a few seconds, and then I'll share the answer. Are you ready? Go. Okay, thank you. <coughs> so let's have a quiz. Let's see if anyone's brave enough, because I can't really see you. So if you're brave enough, shout out a country that you think is in the top three. China? India? Shh! I know what you're doing, by the way. You Mexicans are very clever. You're thinking, if we shout out all the countries, we'll be right. <laughs> Finland, somebody said quietly over here. When everyone else was busy, someone went, mm. What about the bottom? Name me some countries they think that are at the bottom. Bangladesh? Mexico? Do you know, you're amazing. You're like the British, aren't you? You're just so miserable about yourselves. Do you know, I was in a taxi yesterday talking about the World Cup. And I asked the driver who was going to win the World Cup. And he went, not Mexico. <laughs> he said, what do you think? I said, not England. <laughs> Brilliant, huh? Okay. I'm going to show you the next slide. Now, the next slide, I've put them in the correct order. And in red writing, in the brackets, I've also put where they rank in the total list of 121. Are you ready? Here we go. Some people are going, yes! And you know what? Look, Mexico is in the top half. Yes. Not as high as England, all right? The UK is higher. Right? Now, I find this list really interesting. Because if you compare it to the PISA International Education League table, it's almost the wrong way round. Now, what should that tell us about the future of education? The 22nd century is dependent on the ability to be innovative and entrepreneurial. We should not be copying the systems in China, who are 47th currently into the international tables. What interests me when you look at the top of the list, particularly 
in countries like Canada, Australia, Sweden, and Finland. They run education systems that are focused on human development more than academic performance. That, to me, is a very interesting statistic. So if we're looking to create systems for the 22nd century, that's where we should be exploring what the future of education should be about. And let me take that to another level. I recently had another extraordinary opportunity. A few, just about a year ago, actually, I was uh, giving a keynote speech in Riyadh, in Saudi Arabia. And the other keynote speaker was a man who's changed the world. Now, in my life, I've had the incredible privilege of meeting many amazing people. But I don't think I've ever actually spent time with anyone who you can say has changed the world until now. So I had five minutes with this other speaker in the room between our speeches. Imagine my excitement when I found out that on the flight back from Riyadh to London, which is about seven and a half hours, I was sat next to him. I was so excited. He wasn't. I was like, yes! He was like, no. <laughs> the man's name was Steve Wozniak. I know, exactly. The co-founder of Apple. The man who actually designed Apple computers. You can imagine, having seven hours to talk to somebody like that was a really interesting insight into the 21st and 22nd century. So we talked a lot. And the first thing I want to say about Steve is that he is an amazing man. You would never know that he's Steve Wozniak. He is very modest. He isn't interested in fame or wealth. He's a very shy man. He's an uneasy hero. Do you know what I mean? And he said to me, you know, when I was about eight or nine years of age, he said, I was a dysfunctional child. I didn't know how to make friends. I was one of those children who would sit at the back of my classroom wishing I knew how to play. And every time I'd try, it would end in failure. I didn't know how to talk to my friends. I didn't know how to play. He said, and I didn't genuinely believe I was ever going to change the world. But he said, I remember as an eight-year-old child, sitting there, thinking to myself, when I grow up, I want to make the world a better place for people like me. And he said, as an eight-year-old child, Richard, I figured I had two ways to do that based on my experience. He said the first was to be an engineer. He said my father was an engineer, and I realized from very early on that engineers change the world. He said the other and this was the moment I fell in love with him. He said the other was to be a teacher. He said because as an eight-year-old child, the only time I felt truly confident, the only time I truly believed in myself was when I was in the company of one particular teacher. So yet again, even Steve Wozniak is telling me that great education is about human relationships. 
So he said, when I grew up, he said, I actually chose engineering. Because, he said, to be honest with you, there's more money in engineering. But here's the thing. He said to me, you know, when I left Apple, he said I was very lucky because I never needed to work another day in my life. He said, so I decided that what I wanted to do next was to accomplish my other ambition. So he said, what the world doesn't know about me is for the seven years after I left Apple, I decided to go and teach in a local state school. And I taught technology to seventh grade students. Can you imagine, by the way? Can you imagine being a child in that class? Boys and girls, your new teacher of technology, Steve Wozniak. He knows what he's talking about. So, so Steve has opinions about education, you see. And now I really wanted to hear them. Because he wasn't some expert from over here. Not only had he changed the world and invented equipment that has marked the 21st century, he's also been a teacher. So I said to him, what would you say you've learned most about the challenge of education in the 21st and 22nd century? And he said, well, really, Richard, it's very simple. He said, what you teach really isn't important. He said, but how you learn is vital. So when we're talking about developing systems for the 21st and 22nd century, we've got to stop thinking about what are we going to teach them? What are we going to teach them? And remember that it's the skills of how we learn that matters most. So then I said, well, how, how did you come to that opinion, Steve? And he said, well, it started really when Steve and I when Steve Jobs and I set up Apple, he said, you know, we were a couple of kids, a couple of college dropouts who were mucking about with technology. He said, I was quite happy soldering bits of wire to transistors and making voice-changing machines. That's, he said, how he started. The first project he gave himself because they used to like um, making joke phone calls. So he started off by making a machine that changed the tone of your voice. This is Steve Wozniak, and he went on to change the world. He said, so we really had no idea. He said, but the thing with Jobs was he was always ambitious. And also, he was an unbelievable salesman. He said, so he used to go to places like Hewlett Packard and sell them stuff. And he'd get them to pay him hundreds of thousands of dollars. And then he'd come back to our garage and he'd say, Steve, Hewlett Packard have just paid us $150,000 for this piece of equipment. And Wozniak said to me, I used to look at him, Richard, and say, but Steve, we haven't got that equipment. And Jobs used to say to him, well, you've got 72 hours to invent it then. <laughs> so he said, you know, things happened really fast because all of this money was suddenly being thrown at us. And we knew we were going to have to build a proper business which he said was scary because we were two kids mucking about. He said, but you know, Steve Jobs' genius was that he knew that if Apple was to have a future, it couldn't be a company that made things. 
He said, you know, to me very early on, he said, if Apple is a company that makes things, within three years, we'll be dead. He said, Apple has to be a company that continually invents new things. He said, now the interesting thing about that was the kind of people we were going to have to employ. He said, the real challenge for us was we were in the heart of Silicon Valley. We were in the place where the world's cleverest people were hanging out. All the world's geniuses in mathematics and science and physics and computer engineering were all coming to Silicon Valley. We had Sanford University, probably the most technologically advanced university in the world, in the middle of the valley. He said, so employing clever people was going to be really easy. Because everyone you met had the brain the size of a planet. He said, but we knew that's not what we needed. And he said, one night, Steve and I went to a bar to talk about how we were going to recruit people. And he said, over a beer, we came up with a mantra. He said, jobs liked mantras. So we came up with a mantra. He said, and it was this. He said, it must be working because Apple still use it today at the heart of their recruitment process. He said, at Apple, we will never employ anybody who needs managing. Now just think about that for a minute. We will never employ anybody who needs managing. Now, I would relate that to education, because I would say that if that's what the world of employment is looking for in the future, we need to design an education system where teachers, sorry, where children learn that they don't need to be taught. Because the fundamental biggest problem with our education system is that from the earliest stages of education development, we teach children to listen to other people who will tell them what they need to know, how they need to know it, and then how we're going to test them to make sure they know it the way we told them they had to know it. So what we're actually doing is removing children's ability to learn. They become passive. And it's why so many people who are adults living now in the heart of the 21st century are finding life so difficult because we weren't trained to think for ourselves, to solve problems for ourselves. We were trained to rely on other people to do it for us. So what we need is an education system that isn't added on to, but is radically transformed. Even the OECD themselves agree, by the way. Because a month before the latest PISA reports was published, in October of 2013, the OECD produced another report, which I think is one of the most powerful I've ever read about the future challenges for education. And sadly, governments ignored it. And so did the media because it says some really, really uncomfortable things about education policy in most countries in the world. So the report, if you want to find it, is called The Skills Outlook. It is the first global report of its kind, exploring the links between employability, skills, and education. And it has some fascinating things to say. So I've picked out four of the key headlines from that report that I want to share with you today. They are four of the main headlines from the executive summary. And here they are. Number one, the countries that will struggle the most 
to get young people employed are the countries that have become overly obsessed with formal qualifications. Because what happens in countries that are obsessed with formal qualifications is the education system increasingly becomes focused on teaching to the test. It is not focused on teaching the life skills that young people need to gain employment. Number one finding in the OECD skills report. Number two, and this is based on a survey of thousands of the world's most successful companies. 50 years ago, the most important skill a young adult could possess were routine cognitive skills. In other words, the ability to take on board information and to repeat it and to remember it. However, when you look at the graph now of desirable skills and employment, routine cognitive skills are almost not of interest at all. It's why more and more blue chip companies around the world are no longer interested in degrees. What's fascinating though is if you look at the graph, routine cognitive skills now are down here. By far, the fastest rising and most important skill you can have as a future employee are interpersonal skills. That now is the single most marketable skill you can demonstrate to a future employer, interpersonal skills. So any future education system surely has to have the development of interpersonal skills at the very heart of whatever the future of education is going to be. Otherwise, we will continue to elegantly prepare our children for a world that no longer exists. The next one fascinates me too. Because one of the other things that's very clear in the report is the fact that employers are looking for young people who can constantly learn, can constantly adapt, and constantly change. They are no longer looking for employees that will sit at their desk in an office and do their job quietly and just get on with it. They want employees who will challenge the world, who will continue to question, continue to evolve, continue to challenge themselves and their organizations. The fourth one fascinates me too. And it fascinates me because I think this is by way of celebration. Celebration for an organization like Fondacion Telefonica because they're leading the way in so many areas. Because the fourth thing this report says is that there need to be far closer links between the world of work and the world of education. For far too long, educators sit here. Businesses sit here. These people complain about what these people are doing. And these people complain about what these people are doing. The phrase has already been shown this morning. It takes a village to raise a child. And that means we need to break down the walls between business and education, and we need to work closer together. It also, by the way, means that one of the toughest challenges for us is to make sure that parents have to play a more active role in the education of their children. They simply cannot be allowed to drop their children at the school gate when they're five years of age and pick them up at 18 years of age educated. We need to work harder to collaborate on a truly global scale. We need to stop seeing each other as the enemy and start to realize that it's only if we work in proper partnership that we will help to create a world 
that is fit for our children. There was an interesting report that was produced a number of years ago now by a man called Professor Henry Jenkins, who was the head of Futures Thinking at MIT, possibly the coolest job ever. He was asked to produce a report into what it meant to be literate in the 21st century. It's a very interesting report. And what I've done is pulled out for you some of the key headlines again. The report, by the way, was not sponsored by the education sector. It was sponsored by the business sector. The top one fascinates me. Because society seems to think that play is only something for young children. That as children get older, they shouldn't waste their time in education playing. That play is for little kids. Well, here's an interesting thought for you. One of the most common questions I get asked as I travel the world is, Richard, where is the world's best education? Where can we find the best education on the planet? Where are these amazing, wise people? Are they at Harvard? Are they at Yale? Are they at Oxford or Cambridge? Where are they, Richard? We need to find them. And then they sit back, waiting for me. Me! You can tell I'm not an overly intelligent person. And they want me to tell them. Well, they should know. They're not going to get the answer they think. Because when they sit back like this, tell us, tell us, tell us. <laughs> tell us your wisdom. <laughs> I say to them the same thing every time. The best models of education anywhere in the world are to be found in the best run early years education environments. Go and find the best centers in your neighborhood for under five education. And you will find the best models of learning anywhere in the world. Let's think about this for a minute. The experts will tell us that we learn somewhere between 70 and 75% of everything we learn in our lifetime before we're five years old. Now, I'm not talking about stuff. I'm not talking about remembering information. But think about what we learn in the first five years of being on this planet. We learn to walk and talk. We learn to understand body language and vocal expression and facial expression. And we learn those incredibly complex things before we're five years of age and before somebody sits us at a desk and tells us to get a textbook out and learn what I'm going to teach you. And most of what we find is that those environments are rich in play, in interaction, in experiences, which provoke emotions as well as the mind. The heart and the mind together are the most powerful forms of education. So why is it that as students get older, we think the best model of learning is to sit them in a room like this, listening to old people like me tell them stuff? It doesn't work. It never has, and it never will. So we need to create education systems that are founded on play. Here's another thought for you. Apple really interests me. And in my new book about change, one of the things I talk about, because it just came to me one day, is in many ways the perfect citizen of the 22nd century should be like the iPhone. It should be a blank canvas that at various points in its life 
can be filled with different programs to achieve different things at different times. And that should mean, maybe, that the education system should be like the, I, the app store, where we can dip in and find new things when we need them, and install them, and understand them, and when they're no longer relevant to us, ditch them, go back to the iTunes store, and find the next app that works for us in the moment that we need it. Which means we need education to be personalized. Because, of course, the genius of the iPhone is it doesn't tell people what it has to do. What it does is it gives you a blank canvas, and then it gives you a store, and then it says, you do what you need, and if you find something you need to do, you'll find the answer in the app store. You'll find that tool there. But we're not going to tell you what tools to use, because we know you know. But when you're ready, we're there. And we can help you do the things that you need to move on. So maybe the future of education should be a bit like the App Store. We also need to get out more. One of the problems with conversations about education and the future of education is most of the time it involves educators. Now, I'm one, so I can say this. Educators are not terribly good at getting out more. Educators tend to hang out with other educators. Have you noticed this? A lot of educators only have relationships with other educators. We tend to set, tell people we're too busy to do anything else because we're educating. You know, your friends phone you up and they say, would you like to come out? on Saturday night, and you say, no, because I'm too busy educating. So when we talk to educators about being innovative and being creative and doing things differently, we actually don't have a terribly large viewpoint of the world on which to make new ideas. If you think about the very process of creativity, Creativity needs us to constantly st be stimulated by new ideas and new thinking. Otherwise, you can only ever recycle the things you already know. It's why, over the last 30 years, education hasn't really moved very far. Because we keep just tweaking the same things. We do the same things, but just slightly differently. Interactive whiteboards. Do you remember interactive whiteboards? Some middle-aged man like me, about 15 years ago, went to an exhibition in Las Vegas, and he saw an interactive whiteboard. And he went, because middle-aged men do, that's amazing. <laughs> that is the future of education. If we spend millions of dollars putting those in every classroom in the world, we will transform education. And what happened? We spent millions of dollars putting interactive boards in every classroom. And they're used in exactly the same way old-style boards were used. It's changed nothing. So one of the challenges for us as a profession and people working around education is to get out more. We need to hang out with people and have conversations with people outside of education. I wonder how many of you recognize this man. Yeah, look at him. This is so sad. For those that don't know, that is Ferran Adria. Ferran Adria is probably the greatest chef of his generation. For 10 years, he ran the restaurant in Spain called El Bulli, which was awarded year after year as the finest, most innovative restaurant on the planet. Now, the interesting thing about what Ferran did at El Bulli, in February 2012, at the height of its power, 
It was getting over a million requests a year for table reservations. The most successful restaurant in the world. And what did he do in February 2012? He shut it. He closed it down forever. And he chose to use the money because he said, I am no longer able to be creative. I am too busy doing the same thing every day. Because people come to my restaurant and they want certain dishes. And he said, my passion always lay in breaking the rules. So he took the money from El Bulli and he opened a center in Barcelona called El Tola. And what he's currently doing is building an online resource for the world called the Bullipedia, which will be a free resource challenging the very concept of culinary arts, available to everybody. And what he now does, he has this amazing center, and he keeps challenging the conventions of cooking. But in order to do that, every few weeks, he brings together a group of people at El Tola, and he asks them to, he asks them to challenge a convention of cooking. The interesting thing is, in the room, and they spend maybe three, four, five days together, out of the maybe 15 people in the room, there will only be two chefs. There will be business leaders, scientists, people from the world of the performing arts, from all walks of life, and he lays them a challenge. And the reason he puts people from so many backgrounds together is because he will get so many fresh perspectives, so many fresh ideas, so many new ways of thinking. With all due respect to my sort, if all we do is we ask professors to change education, we will get nothing but the same ideas we have always got. So we need to create an environment where we bring people together from a diverse range of backgrounds to truly debate how the future of education should be. Because it will take people from outside of education to ask the kind of questions that we simply don't know how to ask. The other thing we need to do is we need to have a greater range of experiences to fire exactly the same thing. And it's here I'm going to end. Because this final point, for me, has two points. We need an education system that is not about putting our children in one building for five years of their lives, looking at the same walls, listening to the same people, talking about the same things. How sad is it, by the way, that if you have children at home, they can tell you what they're going to be doing at 10 o'clock every Monday morning, at 2 o'clock every Tuesday afternoon, at 1 o'clock every Wednesday. How exciting a life is that exactly, right? And they know exactly where they'll be sat at the same desk, in the same room, day after day, hour after hour. And we wonder why it is our children lack imagination. We need to get them out more. We need an education system that is constantly stimulating our children, that is constantly unknown, that is constantly changing. And one of my favorite examples of just how we can do that comes from this organization. This, of course, was Steve Jobs' hobby. When he was sacked from Apple, in his spare time, he set up Pixar. Now, let me tell you a little bit about this, because I think this is a really interesting model. So Pixar, when they were set up, were created for one reason and one reason only. They were created to revolutionize the way films were made. They wanted to create a new kind of film company. They wanted to take some of the greatest geniuses from the world of technology with some of the most creative minds from the arts and filmmaking and bring them together in a whole new organization to see if they could break the rules and make films in a whole new way. 
And they knew that in the first few years, that would be easy. Being the world's most innovative film company would be easy because everything was new. Everything was about new ideas. It was an explosion of people coming together for the first time. But they also knew that the more successful that Pixar became, the longer the company was running, the less creative the organization would be because they would get into habits. They would get into ways of working. People would then have jobs that they had to do day after day after day. So one of the first things they did when they set up Pixar was they created something called Pixar University. And Pixar University works like this. Every employee at Pixar, from the chief executive to the young people that work in the post room, under paid contracted time, have to spend working time during the working week outside of the organization, exploring something new. They can explore anything they like, but there are two rules. One, whatever they choose to explore can have absolutely nothing to do with their jobs. And two, it has to be accredited. So in other words, it has to be of value. They can't just choose to go and walk on a beach which would be nice. And when they've got an accreditation, they have to share it with the entire organization so everybody else can find out what you're interested in and what you're doing, which of course in itself allows people who would maybe not normally talk to each other time to meet and talk to one another about new shared interests. It creates an environment of constant stimulation. You can do anything. And one of my favorite stories is this. When people get their new accreditations, their names are circulated on the digital network around Pixar. So everybody can see on their computers who's got a new accreditation and what it is they did. And one day, one of the creative directors was logging off her computer at lunchtime to go down to the restaurant to get some lunch. And as she was logging off on her computer, a new few, uh, some new names appeared saying that they'd got accreditations and what they'd done. Anyway, she turned off her computer and she went down to get her lunch. And she was walking with her tray along the salad line. And the man behind the salad counter was serving her salad. And she looked up and she saw her name badge, his name badge. And she realized it was one of these people. So she said, have you just done something new at the university? And he said, yes. She said, what was it you did again? He said, I learned to pilot a hot air balloon. She went, wow. How was it? And he said, it was amazing. He said, I'm a simple man, so I don't have words. But what I can tell you, he said, is that when I was up in the balloon on my final flight, which I had to take on my own in order to get my license, whilst I was up there, he said, for the first time in my life, I felt truly free. Anyway, she finished the conversation, and she went and sat down, and she had her lunch, and she went home that night, but she couldn't get it out of her head. And so the next day, the next morning, she went and found the guy who was serving the salad. And she said, you know, your story is amazing. She said, so I've spoken to your manager, and I've got you permission for the next week to come and work with my creative team. Because I think there's a story for a movie in what you told me yesterday. Now, I don't know how many of you follow Pixar films or how many of you have seen the film Up. That film was created from that story. Now, if we're to create an education system for the future, 
We have to allow our children to have experiences which will stimulate their imaginations, which will allow them to go on and have conversations, to build dreams which could take them to places we can never imagine. Because the one thing we know for sure about the 22nd century is we have no idea what it's going to be like. Ladies and gentlemen, thank you very much indeed.